All right. Good morning, New Life Church. Man. So as, as uh, Jason mentioned, Pastor James is still out. Uh, but with everything going on in the world, I just wanted to assure you he is alive and well. Uh, he is just uh, on his 30th, or celebrating his 30th wedding anniversary with Kamani in Colorado. So yeah, you can clap for that. 30 years, that's a big deal. Uh, that's longer than some of y'all been alive. Uh, not some of me, but uh, <laughs> Jason, thanks, Michael. Um, so he's been sending all these pictures from Colorado, and they are amazing. And I am not at all jealous. Uh, that's not true. Uh, <laughs> hey, but hey, I, I really want to jump straight in today. Um, so I've known for several weeks that I was going to be speaking today, which I don't know if that makes it eat better or worse, because I really start like trying to dive in and be like, okay, God, what am I supposed to be talking about this week? And uh, at the beginning of the week or so, uh, it hit me like a truck. I want to talk to you guys today about being offended. And I'm just kind of setting the stage. It all started with a conversation I had with Kelly. I don't remember if it was two weeks ago, three weeks ago, last week. I don't remember. But Pastor James said something about how the voice of the Holy Spirit sounds a lot like Kamani's voice to him. Uh, it's the same thing with me, except it's, it's Kelly. It's not Kamani's. If it was Kamani's, that'd be weird. Um, but we were having a conversation, and I was talking to her about how, you know, we've been at this campus for five years now. And uh, we were at the Conway campus for six years before that. And in all of these years, I was talking about all the friends that we had that no longer go to New Life Church. Now, uh, some of them, uh, they moved. They moved to another state or whatever. Uh, some of them, they planted new churches. That's fantastic. We got some friends that are full-time missionaries. They're traveling the world right now, just doing mission work wherever they can. That's incredible. And, you know, I love New Life Church. It's a great church. Uh, but we're, like what Jason said, we're not the only church. We're not the best church. We are a church, and there are many good churches out there. Uh, I have some friends. We have friends who have been called into another church, whether it's because of a ministry or whatever. They're like, God just really put this on my heart, and they are doing great, and we are happy for them. That's exciting whenever they are stepping into whatever God called them to do. But these aren't the friends I was talking about. I was talking about the people that were plugged into church. They were, in some cases, leaders. They were in, uh, leading life groups. They were serving. They had support people that were around them all the time. And then something happened, whether on a, on a life group or at a life group, whether on Sunday morning. But something happened, and they became offended. Uh, some of these people, they don't go to church anymore. They still say they believe, but if you look at life, there's, their life, there's really no fruit of that. Uh, some of these people, they landed in other churches, and some of them, God uh, healed their heart, and they are doing great. And again, I'm extremely happy for them because they're in a great place. Uh, some of them, they're just so eaten up with bitterness that you see it and you hear it every time they open their mouth. And I, was, and I was talking to Kelly about it, and I was just frustrated. And I was talking about these people, when they leave like this and they leave offended, don't they know they're just listening to the lies and the voice of the enemy? And, and, I, was, and I was talking about her, and what I expected was for her to say those words that I really love to hear her say, you're so right. You're so right, baby. Like, those are like, okay, my second favorite thing to hear her say. Um, but we won't talk about the first. Okay, so, but... I was expecting her to reciprocate my frustration. But instead she said, you know, not everybody was taught how to handle conflict or disagreement with another believer. This floored me. Like I started thinking about it and it was this simple phrase and I started diving into like a week long like chasm of, of research, and I started getting into God's Word, and I started reading all these different books and articles and listening to different sermons, and like dozens and dozens and dozens of hours later, I discovered this. I was offended. But you know what? A lot of people are. Like, I think most people would agree that being offended is a cultural epidemic right now. It's everywhere. But can I tell you something? It's everywhere in the church, too. 
And many of us have this wrong idea of being offended. Like when we think about it, we think about people in our society who are so desperate to find something that offends them. And you're like, if they just get thicker skin and stuff. Like that's our idea of what being offended is. And can I tell you something? The enemy is so good at his craft. Like I fully believe that is what he wants us to think. That's how he wants us to see it. Because if we see it that way, Look, there are so many different verses in the Bible that talks about uh, being offended and how to handle being offended. But if we're not willing to see us or admit that, you know what, we actually are offended, then we're going to think those verses don't apply to us. And then we're going to cut ourselves off from what God is actually trying to do in our lives. So I do want to say there's two major categories of people that are offended. There's the people who are have a genuine offense. These are people who have been mistreated. There's a legitimate hurt at a legitimate offense here. All right. The second is a group is people who they think they've been mistreated. And those people are working with false information just or inaccurate information. And uh, just to be honest, I'm, I'm not really interested in addressing that group today. I want to talk about people who have legitimate hurts. So let's dive into the word and see what it says. Matthew 24, verses 10 through 13, it says, And then many will be offended and betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. So leave this up here for a little bit, if you could. A couple things I want to point out from this. First of all, it says many will be offended. Like, who are we talking about here? I mean, it'd be easy to look around the world, especially in the United States, and see somebody that's offended. That's just truth. But it's not just talking about somebody. He's talking about the church, many in the church. Well, how do we know this? Well, look at that last line. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Look, the only people who would be saved were the people that are the believers, the people in the church. This isn't just anybody. He is talking about the church. And the word many, this is what's scary for me. The word many, um, it's actually the word palus. And in most cases from what I've seen, it means the majority. So he is saying that most Christians will be offended. So, so we'll be offended, and then what? Then we start to betray each other. And now, again, I think we have this wrong idea of betrayal. We think everybody's going to go all like Judas and start selling people out for silver or like Benedict Arnold. But I think in the most simple, basic terms, what this is going to look like is that people are going to seek their benefit over the benefit of others. How many of you know that is a relationship killer? So, so what we're going to see is people in the church are going to be offended. It's going to cause them to put their needs above the needs of others. And that will sever the relationships of the church. Now I'm going to come back to this passage a little bit later. I want to spend some time talking about that part right there. Relationships will be severed. Because this is exactly what the enemy wants. He knows that wherever two or three gather... In the name of Jesus, that is for one purpose, for doing what it is that God wants us to do, to worship him, to lift him up, that Jesus himself will step right down in the middle of that conversation, in the middle of that relationship, and that's the last thing the enemy wants. He wants us to be offended, and here's why. Proverbs eighteen nineteen says, An offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city. Arguments separate friends like a gate locked with bars. When we become offended, we are harder to win back than a fortified city. Now, most of us, like, and this might be a little lost in translation a little bit because, I mean, I look around and I've never really seen a fortified city with my own eyes. Like Conway, Little Rock, none of that. But in these days, they knew what that meant. Like a fortified city, the reason it was hard to win back was because of its defenses. Most specifically because they had a giant wall that was all around it. When we become offended, we put these walls up. Paul later calls them strongholds. So today I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about how do we become offended? What do we do when we are offended? And how to live an unoffended life. So let's start with the first. How do we become offended? As I said earlier, I think a lot of us still have this wrong idea. So I really want to clarify. This 
is a genuine offense. Someone has said something or done something and it has hurt you in some way and they might not even realize that they have done it. Um, You know the old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will hurt forever. Like that. That's my version, right? It's it's true. Uh, But the thing about that with words, like for me specifically, like if words are really going to have an impact on me, they have to be tied to some kind of relationship. For instance, if some dude I didn't really know came up to me like in Walmart and was like, hey, Michael, you really smell bad. Like, really smell bad. Like, when's the last time you showered? I mean, I might feel a little self-conscious. Like, I would like, I'd go home, I'd probably shower twice. Uh, Maybe look at changing my shampoo or deodorant or something. But ultimately, this would not have a huge impact on my life. But if I get down from the stage today, and Chuck comes over here, gives me like, you know, little high five, bro hugs or whatever. It was like, dude, Michael, that was the worst message I've ever heard. Now, first of all, Chuck's one of the people that I like trust most in my life. So my first thing, I would be shocked and then I would be devastated. OK, and it's because of that relationship. This is the start of being offended. You get hurt. But it doesn't just stay there. It goes beyond just being hurt. When you are offended, you are giving temporary residence to the offense in your heart. For me, like, I like to dwell on it. Like, I like to think about it a lot and run it and kind of, like, maybe you're a warrior and you, like, you're worried about how they took it and you're replaying things in your head over and over and I wish I'd said this. I wish I said this. Um, So something happened not too long ago. Somebody that doesn't go to our church said something, did something that affected Kelly, my wife. She came home and told me about it and I was upset. And how many of you guys can relate about this? So I had a conversation with this dude, like an hour-long conversation, multiple hour-long conversations, telling him what was what, and his business practice is this, and all of that stuff, and all of that happened right here. Like, I don't know who this dude is. I don't know his name. I don't know where he is. But I sure told him off in the conversation I had in my head. Right? This is what being offended is. Like, he was having residence in my heart right there. Like, all right, so let's look here. Luke 17, 1, it says, Then he said to the disciples, Jesus talking, of course, It is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. Look, it is impossible to live life, to go about living in this world and not be offended. They're going to come. It's going to happen. Now, I think we can agree, like, this particular situation here, how this guy ran his business was a very mild offense to me. In the grand scheme of things. What if it was a bigger offense? What if this is something that hurt me very bad? Something that maybe even hurt so much that it shaped the entire, like basically shaped my entire life. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I really don't want you to raise your hand. But I want you to think right now. Have you ever been hurt physically, emotionally? Maybe it was someone that you trusted and loved, cared for so much. I know I have more than once. So preparing for today, I read an article, and the article talked about four causes or four reasons why we will get offended. And and I really love this. I want to kind of go through some of these. The first thing it said is unrealistic or unmet expectations. This is huge for both all offenses, big, small, whatever. We had an expectation that did not get met. Maybe you had an expectation that someone was going to handle things differently. Like, this was big for me. Like, this is something that I realized. Like, I never imagined that these people in my life who I loved and looked up to uh, would get offended. It never even crossed my mind. It had nothing to do with me, but still, it had never crossed my mind that they would get offended. But I had an expectation that if they ever did, they would handle it a certain way. And when that expectation was not met, I was floored. I was like, these are people that I've known, like some of them for over a decade, people that I loved and I looked up to. And and I'm like, and here they go, they get hurt, they get offended. And I'm like, where did you go? It wasn't until I was preparing for this message that I truly realized how much that hurt me. Maybe some of you are here and you have deep, deep hurts. Maybe you have are living offended because someone that you love so much who was supposed to love you didn't. Maybe uh, a family member, maybe a spouse. Like, I can relate. Maybe it's, maybe it's because you had an expectation that the church was supposed to meet and they didn't meet it. 
Maybe it was from a church you grew up with. Maybe it was from this church right here. Look, Jesus didn't say, you know, it's impossible for you to live without offense unless you find the right circle. Unless you find the right, unless you go to the right church. No, wherever you go, you're going to find offense. So we got unmet expectations. What else? We got our own wounded spirit. I right, so when I was in high school, right out of high school, I used to skateboard like all the time. When I mean all the time, I mean five, six, seven hours a day, seven days a week. And I was good too. Like not as good as I thought it was. All right, let's be real. But I was good. And I remember one time I was trying to, to jump a gap. And, uh, and in my head, I remember it like eight or nine feet. But I was like looking at the, ceil- or the floor tiles here, which are like two feet. And I was like, no, it was more like five. Um, but, you know, in my head, it was nine feet. So we're going to go with that. Uh, so I was jumping this gap, and I cleared it. But my board got in front of me. So what happened was my front foot landed on the board. My back foot landed on the ground. Now, the problem is my front foot and the board kept going. My back foot did not. Uh, So I jacked up my ankle really bad. Uh, And as soon as the swelling went down, I just got right back on that board. Probably within the hour, I re-injured it. I don't know what I did, but I did something, swelled up again. But it's, and then it just kept happening. As soon as the swelling went down, I kept getting on the board. And every time I kept hurting my ankle quicker and quicker and quicker. And then finally, uh, I was walking home one day. I was holding my board. And you know those little like concrete slabs that are in front of like parking spots? I wasn't paying attention. I was just walking and just kicked it like normal, like not angry kick, just normal walking kicked it. And my foot swelled up so big, I had to rip my shoe off because it wouldn't fit my shoe. See, what had happened was my ankle had never really healed. It only gave the appearance of being healed. Some of us are walking around already offended. We are already hurt. And we might think we're over something, or maybe we're not willing to admit that we aren't over something, that we are still hurt. But just like my ankle, it becomes so easy to be re-hurt all over again. Uh, The other thing that that we get offended from is holding on to things too long. Isaiah 43, 18, 19 says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. So I think this is similar to having a wounded spirit, but this might not necessarily mean you're still hurt. You might have recovered from the hurt, but you might be in a place where you're still unwilling to move Forward, to move beyond what it is here. Like, but here's the thing, look, God has a plan for us. And it is a good plan, and He wants us to prosper. But what are we still holding on to in our lives that is blocking the new thing that God wants us to do? And the fourth thing that we get offended from is assuming a negative intent. Now, this is a defense mechanism that we build up, and we might not even realize that we've done it. Uh, usually this comes when we've been hurt, when we've been offended. Uh, and the truly terrible thing about this is this usually reinforces the offense or sometimes compounds it. Um, this is not giving people the benefit of the doubt. This is thinking that when people say something, they just mean the worst thing by it. That's like, so if somebody comes up to you and is like, man, your hair looks nice today. And you think, are they saying it didn't look nice yesterday? <laughs> like this is, you just think the worst. We need to give people the benefit of the doubt. And some of you guys might be like, wait a second. Are you telling me I just need this person here? They've hurt me. They've hurt me multiple times. I know what they've done. Are you telling me I just have to trust them again? Well, there's wisdom we need to take. You can protect yourself from being in a position where you're going to get hurt while still guarding your heart from thinking that this person is just out to hurt you we got to use wisdom. And like I said, you know, protect yourself, yes, but look for ways that they have changed, not for ways they haven't. Aren't you glad that knowing everything you've done and knowing what you think about, Jesus saw past all of that and loved us still? Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
It's while we were still sinners, he died for us. Not after we've done enough to show him that we really mean it. Not after we've done enough to show him that we've really changed while we were sinners. Even knowing that the, he, some of us, many of us, may, won't, eat, won't ever accept the gift that he gave us. All right, so I want to jump. Why or what do we do when we are offended? What do we do when we are offended? How do we get over the hurt in our lives? Well, I want to start off by saying not really what we do, it's what we don't do. Don't isolate yourself. That is the worst thing. Proverbs 18.1 says, A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. It's funny because this is usually the first thing we want to do. We want to pull back away from everything. Look, living offended is a breeding ground for deception. In that first verse we read, it talks about this one. I'm not going to go to it right now. But it says that we will be deceived by false prophets. But we're not just going to be deceived by false prophets. We are also going to be deceived by other offended believers. And ultimately, we will be deceived by the enemy. If we isolate ourselves, it's going to be so much easier to remain and live that way, to live offended, hurt, bitter, cold. And it says we will rise or rage against all wise judgment. The Bible also says we need to go to the person. This is something a lot of people don't like to do because it's hard. But Matthew 18, 15 through 16 says, If another person or if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. The other person listens and confesses it. You have won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. Talk to the person. Now, I really need to clarify here, okay? Because many of us, I don't think we really understand the point of communication. We think it's to be heard. We actually talk about that in, in premarital counseling, uh, that people think that the point of communication is to be heard, but really it's for mutual understanding. What happens is when you're hurt and you're angry and you're bitter, you want to go to this person and you want to just vomit all over them. You're like, do you know what you did to me? You hurt me. You did this. And when because you, you did this, this happened. And like, don't do that. That doesn't help anything. Instead, we need to humble ourselves, then go to the other person. Maybe there's something that you've done that you need to apologize for. Start the conversation with that. Hey, man, can we talk? I just wanted to apologize to you. Like, I have been really, really critical of you lately. Look, I promise you that if you'll start a conversation sincerely with this, that conversation is going to go 20 times better. What else? What else do we need to do? We need to love. Who do we love? The person that offended us. Matthew 5, 44. I love this verse. It says, but I tell you to love your enemies and pray for anyone who mistreats you. It's talking about loving unconditionally no matter what they do. I love how David says in Psalm 35, he says, malicious witnesses testify against me. They accuse me of crimes I know nothing about. They repay me evil for good. I am sick with despair. I'm gonna pause right here for a second. Some of you guys, that's your conversations you're having daily. Your conversations with your friends, your family, your coworkers, whatever, they sound just like that. They did this to me, then they did this to me, and I didn't even know what they were talking about, but they said this about me. And if we stopped there, this verse would have an entirely different meaning. But if you keep going, yet, when they were ill, I grieved for them. I denied myself by fasting for them, but my prayers returned unanswered. He was praying for them. He was praying for them to have healing. I was sad as though my friends or family, or as though they were my friends or family, as I were grieving for my own mother. The cool thing, like David wrote this, but he didn't just write it, he lived it. When Saul passed away, Saul, the guy who tried to kill him many times for multiple years, he grieved, he mourned. When's the last time we prayed for someone we were mad at? Someone who hurt us uh, or let us down. And I mean, like, really prayed, not like, God, get him. Right? You're like, God, just help them see the wickedness of their ways. Father, help them change. Help them be completely different. Help them to know how much they hurt me. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, God, would you bless them? God, would you give them 
peace. Would you help them to be filled with your spirit? Father, would you bless their business? Help their business grow. Father, would you grant them financial prosperity, success in everything they do? Everything you want to pray for yourself, pray that for them. Some of you might be in here thinking, you're like, well, you don't really know what they've done. Like, you don't know how bad they've hurt me. You don't know how bad they've hurt someone that I love. You don't know what they did to me. Maybe you forgot what you did that put Jesus on the cross. All right, so how do we live unoffended lives? One word, exercise. Some of you are like, I'm out. <laughs> like, I don't go to the gym. If you see me running, it means somebody's chasing me. You better run too. No, but that, I'm not talking about that kind of exercise. <laughs> so he said, thank you. <laughs> All right, so I want to read this out of Acts 24, 16, but here's the thing. I'm going to use the King James Version. I don't normally use the King James Version, not because there's anything wrong with it. It's just because, um, well, I was a math teacher for a reason, and there's a lot of big words. Uh, but it says, and herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. So I like this King James Version because it uses the word exercise there. Other translations say things like take pains or do my best, or strive. But the word that's translated there for exercise in the Greek is askeo. And it literally means to exercise oneself, to take pains, to labor. I like this word exercise because it implies a hardship. It implies that it's difficult. So Luke wrote Acts, but in this particular verse, this particular chapter, this is actually Paul talking, uh, and Paul's saying he works at it. And it takes work. He's implying that it's not easy. But the thing about exercise, just like with our muscles, is the more we do it, the easier it becomes. So living unoffended, right, is living in forgiveness. Because that's what it really comes down to is if you, if you are offended, you are living in unforgiveness. So the question when I say how do you live an unforgi- or how do you live an unoffended life, I'm really saying how do you live a life full of, un- or full of forgiveness? We exercise. We practice. We forgive over and over and over again. Not once, not twice, not seven times, seven times, 70 times. We forgive as quickly and as often as we need until it becomes second nature. How else do we do it? We fight. Not each other. But we fight. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, it says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. This is the strongholds I was talking about. These are the walls that we build up in our life that isolate us. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Look, we take captive our thoughts. We do this by speaking out against them. Look, there is power in speaking and reading God's word out loud. We also do this by submitting our wills, our will to God's will. Like, and we got to stop categorizing sin. Like we're like, you know, murder, that's a bad sin. Adultery, man, that's a terrible sin too. But you know what? Unforgiveness, that's a weakness. If we get to the point and we run from unforgiveness the same way that we run from murder or an adultery, that's when we find freedom. That's when we truly get delivered. So I want to land right here. I want to land with, why is all this important? Like, why do we need to do all this? What's the, well, I mean, it's just a little unforgiveness. Like, what's, well, first of all, unity in the church. That is major. The enemy wants to divide us. He wants to isolate us. And we're called to live life together. That's what life groups are about. They're going to help hold you accountable. They're going to help bring people. They're going to help support you. But I want to go back to this first verse that I read. I'm not going to read the whole verse here, but I want to look at the line where it says, lawlessness will abound. The love of many will grow cold. 
All right, so the lawlessness is talking about, this is not a civil lawlessness. This is not living in a state of anarchy. What it's talking about here is, it is saying that people will not be submitted to the will and the authority of God. And when this happens, when we live offended, we are not submitted to the will and authority of God. But when this happens, the love that's in us, the agape love, it grows cold and it turns to bitterness. And, and what happens is we start to live life just going through the motions, just trying to just check things off. You come to church, check. Daily Bible study, oh, who's got time for that? Nobody's going to know anyway. You might find that you stop connecting with God during worship. It's just this time here where it's playing music, it's just something we do. Before some dude gets up here and talks for 30 minutes, I don't know, I stopped getting anything out of the message a long time ago. Eventually, you stop seeing a reason to go to church. Maybe you start making excuses like, it's better for you not, and I'll have more time, and this isn't helping me, or whatever. And you start to make excuses of why you don't need to be connected to the bride of Christ. 11 years ago, right after I became a Christ follower, I felt this stronger than ever. I had been hurt. And the person that hurt me, they sent my world into a tailspin. But God picked me up literally from rock bottom. I found freedom. I found forgiveness. I found love. I found joy. But I was still hurt. I was still living offended. And the person that hurt me, I wanted them to be punished. I did. I remember realizing that there was one point like I wanted to be covered in God's grace. I wanted that so desperately for my life and everything that, that comes with that. But I didn't want that for the other person. In fact, I hoped that God wouldn't forgive them, even if they asked. I had a choice to make that day. And I chose to pray for them. I'll never forget. I chose to pray blessings over them. Not just that one time. I chose to pray repeatedly over them. Every time I felt bitter, that's when I chose to pray. I pray that God would bring them joy. I pray that God would bless them. I pray that God would protect them. I pray that God would give them financial freedom. I pray that their needs would be met. And if I hadn't made that decision that day, I don't even know if I'd still be going to church probably would have slipped back into this quasi relationship where like, I know God's there, but uh, that's about it. I would, I would be living today in bitterness. I'd be angry. I'd be upset. But instead I found freedom. I found peace and I found joy. So I want to pray for you guys. If you would all close your eyes, bow your heads. I always want to ask this. We've been talking about today about freedom from unforgiveness uh, that comes when you are able to let things go, when you're able to let go of that offense and move forward. But if you've never made a decision for Christ, you might not get that. This might be a foreign concept. We forgive because we've been forgiven, but maybe you're not sure if that's you. Maybe you have never made a decision to ask Jesus to forgive you for what you've done. And if that's you today and you feel like today's the day, I want to uh, invite Jesus to be the Lord of my life for the first time. I want to give you the opportunity to do that today. If you would, would you raise your hand? All eyes are closed. Nobody looking around. Okay. If that's you today, would you pray something like this? Just pray, Father God, I need you. I'm tired of doing this by myself. Father, forgive me for the many times that I've let you down, the many times I've failed trying to do this by myself. Father, Make, please be the Lord of my life. Lead me and just help me to follow in your examples and your ways. And in Jesus' name we pray. Again, eyes closed, heads down. I want to ask this question right here. Maybe you're in this room and you, and you will admit or you know that you've been living offended for a long time. Maybe when I talked about those things, about how you feel the cold inside come to church and you just feel cold you play worship music you read the bible and you're just feeling cold and you're like i'm ready to let this offense go if that's you again raise your hand all eyes are closed nobody looking around i see hands going up all over the place my hands up too 
If that's you, I want you to pray something like this. And I want to pray this over the entire church. Father God, Father, forgive us for holding on to something that's not ours to hold on to. Father, help us to extend the grace that you have given us. Father, we pray for the person right now, the people right now that have hurt us. Father, we just pray that you bless them. Father, grant them all the peace. Father, help them find uh, the joy that can only be found in you. Father, I pray that you would grant them financial prosperity. Father, I pray that you would help their families grow closer together. Father, I just pray that you just bless them in every way. Father, I pray that you will help us have the strength to, uh, to pray this over them as often as we feel hurt, as often as we feel frustrated, no matter what it is that they've done, no matter what it is that where we've come from, Father, that we can always extend the grace that you gave us. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.